this is the hard truth of Tony Schaefer, powered by Six Hour Never Settle. I had a choice of what I carried in combat. I always carry the best. I recommend you carry the best. The best is Six Hour Never Settle. We are on the America Out Loud Talk Radio Network, also available on their podcast network. Check us out, Project Sentinel, projectsentinel.com.net. And we are on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Rumble, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So today we're joined by a Hollywood. I, I, I don't know what you would want to call Bud is like the guy that's done everything in Hollywood, and, and he's written some books. So we're going to talk about one of his books today. We're, we're joined today by Bud Albright. Bud has uh, been a, 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 an author, a, an actor, a, a screenplay writer. I mean, he's he's done everything. So, uh, Bud, uh, we're here today. Uh, welcome, to, welcome to The Hard Truth, first off. Uh, Bud, I think you're there. Well, I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me on the show. I'm uh, I'm uh, delighted uh, that you have interest in uh, our project. It's uh, very, very good and taking off. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. So uh, this is about a book that that you wrote called, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to make sure I want to make sure I get the name right. Tony Ustra. Is that how you pronounce it? Tony Cuesta. Tony Cuesta. Tony Cuesta. Freedom Fighter, The War with Fidel Castro, and To Take Back Cuba. So this is um, right. uh, permutedpress.com. It's available, and we'll, we'll make sure we have this out for people to go find it. And uh, uh, so you're you're a character. I can always, you know, we've, we've just met, but I can tell you're a character just from, just from our conversation already. <laughs> but this guy you wrote about is another character. So Tony, he was uh, like, a, now I'm, a, I'm a retired spy. So I've, you know, as a matter of fact, we talked about in the pre-interview, uh, my Bond moment is actually in the International Spy Museum, one uh, amongst among other spies. But this guy was apparently a real James Bond character. Uh, Custa was Fidel Castro's college roommate and one of his closest friends until, of course, Castro moved off to start working with uh, the old Soviet Union, and uh, and apparently the he did not he was not a fan of communism, which is a good a good thing. So, uh, but you you basically talk about uh, uh, Tony and his freedom fighting uh, background and work in your book. Is that a kind of an accurate description of of of, of what your book covers? Well, basically, basically, I fell into this quite by accident in the 1980s, quite mm-hmm. by accident. I mean, nobody gets on a plane and says, geez, you know, I think there's a movie down there. I'll, I'll go down there and go to Little Havana and sit down and ask the guys playing checkers. If they know Fidel Castro's most dangerous enemy, Tony Cuesta. Uh, you don't do that. But I had an introduction, yeah. <laughs> believe it or not, by an, ex- an ex-Black Panther by incident, who wrote on an envelope uh, on a, a matchbook cover a 305 number, and he said, "If you're interested in meeting the real interesting story in Miami, and the man that uh, I was uh, talking to, the Black Panther, was the first U.S. citizen to hijack a U.S. airliner over U.S. airspace, March 6, 1969, from New York to Havana to uh, uh, Miami to Havana, Cuba." Yeah, uh, he had a ca- kangaroo trial in Spanish. He didn't understand it. They put him, gave him thirty years in prison, and uh, he was in there. He wrote a book called Hijack, and uh, that was out. Anyway, he knew Tony Cuesta. Yeah, and uh, so I came down to Miami and I met Tony Cuesta. He was blind and disabled. Uh, he made thirty-three daring clandestine raids on Cuba. Yeah. Uh, some in broad daylight, and he was a tall six foot four. Uh, he went to school with uh, Fidel Castro. They were the two tallest students at the University of Havana at six three and six four. Good looking guys. Uh, Fidel Castro wanted to be a baseball pitcher and studying law. Tony Cuesta was a Cuban Olympic swimmer. And uh, two tallest students, six three, six four, and they uh, spoke English. They went back and forth to Miami and hung out and chased the women on uh, Veradero Beach in Cuba and came over here and hung out at a place called Cintro Vasco. And uh, Tony uh, went to the hills with uh, 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 Fidel Castro and Raul and Camilio and uh, uh, Che Guevara. Yeah. And uh, Che Guevara, they used to, the, even the Cubans called him the killing machine. He looked like he had movie star looks and Hollywood was uh, enthralled with him, uh, felt he should have a movie or his own TV show. 
but uh, he was a real badass guy, and uh, Tony Cuesta kept him at arm's length. But the reason Fidel Castro got together with him was because uh, he had military experience in Argentina and Bolivia, and he was a soccer star, and he had influential friends, and he was able to get money and guns and ammunition and everything they need to start the revolution in the first place. And Tony went to the hills, and he right. was up there with him. And when they overthrow, overthrew Cuba, uh, this is all, all in the book. Uh, all of the names are exactly true as it happened. And I was privy uh, to his, uh, when he passed in 1992, I was privy to his, uh, his uh, memoir, his tapes, and all of that. And uh, it, uh, it, it is a book that really should be in the, in the schools because it uh it uh it straightens out a lot of the controversy here and there and who did what and why and as tony cuesta told me he said well he always called me mr albright he says mr albright he said i'm not only at war with fidel castro i was at war with the kennedy administration especially bobby kennedy i was at war with the cia i was at war with helen dulles and richard bissell I was at war with everybody, J. Edgar Hoover. He said, I had my hands full. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it, it's incredible. He made 33 dang, daring clandestine raids on Cuba, some in broad daylight, uh, which were stunning. Couldn't do that today. They would uh, have uh, 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 fishing boats uh, uh, at the time until they got their own boat, drag offshore power boats about two miles off the coast of Cuba, and then they would come racing into Havana, Cuba, uh, 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 the uh, the bay, uh, Havana, and into the bay down to the end, and come back and shoot the hell out of everything and blow things up and everything else. But the real story is that uh, uh, Fidel Castro came to Washington after a ticker tape parade and after uh, 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 in New York and. Uh, uh, after uh, winning uh, and overthrew the Batista regime and the whole thing, and uh, went to Nixon, who saw a communist under every rock, and uh, and said that uh, you know they wanted money to rebuild the country, and and uh, Nixon said, no, I'm terribly sorry if, uh, if you're involved with Che Guevara, an ardent communist, and Brother Raúl joined the Communist Party, and Tony and uh, uh, Fidel Castro never did join the. The Communist well, Party. So, so, but but he, yeah, he, I, he stayed away from that. I'd like to break that down a little bit because you mentioned that, that they all were off in the. Because I think people, it sounds like this gives important context to the era. Because one of the things that's notable is that, uh, as you mentioned, they were deposing a, a dictator essentially. Uh, and uh, absolutely, most people weren't against that. I, I think even for the most part, you know, Eisenhower and Nixon. You mentioned Nixon; they weren't completely. Mm -hmm unhappy with that now, batista was a was a pretty pretty brutal guy and as much as anything i think a lot of uh, people who recognize the brutality that his his presidency we'll just call it a presidency because i think that's what he would refer to it we know it's a dictatorship was essentially ripe for people to say look we've had enough and so fidel castro and company to include tony uh castro questra i mean they all were can i say given kind of a uh, a green light from the West to kind of take out Batista was, is that an accurate way that you've, you've come to understand the situation? Well, yeah, the idea was to overthrow the, uh, overthrow the government. They had, right. uh, Batista was tough in this sense. He was tough on the Cuban people, right. but you have to remember that, uh, Meyer Lansky and the five families of New York, were the ones that were, you know, putting the money into Cuba with the hotels and casinos right. and this and that, and even upscale Cubans uh, couldn't go to these facilities. But they brought people in from Latin America and Europe and wealthy uh, Americans to come in and gamble and over from Miami. And they had the G2, which was like a, a rat patrol secret service of uh Batista that would roar around in jeeps uh, and yeah. everything, and they had a ten ten o'clock curfew. And uh, Tony Cuesta wanted no part of politics, but he and his lady got hassled one night on the Malacan, and uh, he went to Fidel and said, "Fidel, how can I help? We have to 
get that SOB out. What can we do? And, uh, and they became good, uh, good friends. They met on the step. They originally met on the steps of the university of Havana in a rusty drinking fountain and Fidel was carrying on and Tony Cuesta walked up behind him and said, what do you expect? Iced rum and Coke. And that's where they became friends. And they were, to, they were friends until, uh, Fidel Castro came back, and for six months, he never told the people that the U.S. wouldn't uh, uh, re rebuild the country. Then the Soviet Union stepped in and said, we'll give you $53 billion a year. And Tony Cuesta could talk to Fidel Castro, not even uh, uh, Raul could talk to his brother like that. And he pulled him aside, and they went for a walk in the rain. And he said, look, Fidel, you're crazy. You think they want what? Leather, bananas, cigars, sugar, I, rum? Not... I don't think so. I don't think so. And what the and, and Tony said, what they want is well, what they actually wanted was submarine pens and refueling docks, and they wanted to take the airport and lengthen the runway and widen it to handle uh, heavy bombers, and uh, they wanted intermediate, intermediate and long-range missile sites in Cuba. And Tony said, look. Fidel, we're going to have spy planes, U-2 planes, flying over here 24-7, and destroyers in the Coast Guard and the Navy circling with missiles pointed at us. And yes, one day there will be uh, an invasion of American troops, or they'll just blow us right off the map. And oh. with that, they figured out how the hell to get out of Cuba, and he did, and he came to Miami and hooked and right away because he was so close to Fidel. They had the CIA and the FBI, which were not friends and sharing information at all, I'm, I'm all over it. So, but that's the thing. So, was this a chicken or the egg thing? But was it that when Fidel Castro came to the United States? Because I look, I, I was not born yet, but I remember uh, the shortly after there was. Uh, I think Castro even was w w greeted very warmly by. Uh, by the the candidates, yes. wasn't there a, a, a reception? Well, not 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 no not 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 the Ken not the Ken not the candidates not gotcha. not a, a warm welcome all. He he was uh, they as soon as uh, uh, Che Guevara got involved, they had a whole dossier on him, and they went well, whoop whoop. Here. Wait a minute yeah. here, the, the the red the red the red flag went on, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah, but the news media sounds like something today, right? The news yeah. media. You know, thought that uh, Che Guevara should have his own uh, television show or put him in films. He's right. a good-looking guy. And uh, Fidel Castro, they were young, suntan heroes that came down from Oriente province and uh, kicked Batista out of the country. And uh, uh, and then the Soviet, then t every the main people around Fidel were right. concerned and wanted to get the hell out of Dodge as soon as they found out that the Soviet Union Union wanted uh, uh, a future in the the the, the politics and the, the the how to run the country right. and, and all the money left first the bustamanes the found rules the cna sugar and all the wealthy people got the hell out of dodge and then in 1961 everyone started leaving cuba yeah, for right. uh, the united states puerto rico and spain and everywhere else Right. No, I get it. I, I, so you could, you know, these these uh, young suntan heroes could just as well have been the Beach Boys, as far as I'm concerned. But with that said, but it's very right. clear yeah. at this point. Well, no, I mean, it, I'm being a little bit light about it, but it was very clear that that there were some opportunities here. But from what you're saying, that Fidel Castro with Tony Quest uh, Quest Quest Quest, I'm terrible with that name. They could have really changed the trajectory of Cuba had 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 Fidel listened to Tony. Is that a, is that a correct assessment? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much. I, I, I would say so. What, what is interesting about the book is that it solves a lot of problems and a lot of questions in the people in the back of people's mind about how things were then, who did what, when, what, and where, and why, and everybody was uh, involved. But we, we didn't have satellites. We didn't have instant television. We didn't have what we have now. Right. And, and we and the, and the media thought they were, uh, you know, darlings, you know, and, uh, you know, said, oh, listen, uh, Ernest Hemingway met Fidel on the hill today and they talked and had some chicken on a bonfire or something. And uh, Errol Flynn was there and, and met Fidel. 
And the press was very, American press was very, very high on the whole thing. The government knew what the hell was going on, but didn't really uh, tell the people that, you know, whoops, Soviet Union, they found out and they went, no, 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 I don't, I don't know about this. Uh, John Kennedy was a young president. And uh, as far as the Bay of Pigs, uh, uh, at the last minute, uh, Adlai Stevenson talked him out of uh, uh, helping support the people that the CIA trained in the Everglades for the Bay of Pigs. And it couldn't have been a worse place. It was Fidel Castro's old shipping ground, uh, his own fishing uh, area, so he knew it well. And he just built a new highway all the way down, so you have tanks and trucks and everything get down there in a hurry. And they had a 16-foot tide change and a reef that would hang up most of the boats if they didn't get in on time. Yeah. And uh, you know the aircraft carrier was sitting out there with our pilots in the planes, ready to help them, and we're t- we're told to stand down. Right. So, so that was the fir- that that was the first disaster. Right. No. No. So I'm familiar with the Bay of Pigs a little bit, and that's something we did study in history back when I was in college. So, did did Tony play a role in the Bay of Pigs specifically? And if so, you know, what was his uh, view of that whole thing? Because that turned out to be a real debacle. Uh, no, he and Andy Pruna and people that used to be swimming stars at the University of Havana became underwater demolition guys and, yeah. uh, you know, Navy SEAL type uh, guys. And they warned Fidel uh, right up front that this is the worst place in the world to try and do a landing. And they yeah. said, well, listen, it came, it came right from Washington. And they thought they thought it was a setup. They said they got to be crazy. There's six wow. different places there on on Cuba that we could land where the tide is low, there's beaches, there's room, the boats can slide in. No, no, we'll do it at El Grohn. We'll do, we'll do it at the Bay of Pigs. And they thought they were all nuts that it was sketchy wow. anyway. Now, Tony Cuesta and his, his men, commandos, went, went, let me back up a little bit. When he came to the U.S., they started Operation Mongoose. Tony Quest was funded by the CIA, and he started... He was part of a, a group of men that started Alpha 66, and he started Commandos L, which was not taking, where we're not taking orders from the CIA or the FBI because they would tell them at different times and back out at the last moment and then send them over under a full moon. And, uh, of course, you know, you can't sneak in anywhere with a full moon. Uh, and they got shot up and had a lot of firefights and, and nearly escaped with, uh, you know, and uh, so they went out on their own. And uh, Tony Cuesta was the only man, the only man alive that ever sank a Russian freighter in peacetime uh, near Havana Harbor. You mentioned that. So and, yeah, uh, that was, can, you, can you talk a little yeah. about that? That sounds like a great story. Oh, about the, uh, uh, the sinking of the boat? Yeah, exactly. The freighter. Oh, all right. Yeah, the, fre- the freighter Baku was loaded with sugar and other, uh, probably cigars and rum and other things too, but mainly <laughs> sugar. And they they came roaring in in the middle of the night with their boats. Uh, came around and they stopped at the stern of the boats and, and and men didn't know what the hell it was on the on the on the uh, on the freighter. They were looking over the side. What's the commotion with the boats down there? And they took a 50-pound charge of uh, uh, a magnet, uh, 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 there's a name for it, but anyway, they stuck it against, above the water line, uh, 50 pounds of the charge of the C4 or something, and yeah. took off, barely, barely, and the damn thing blew up and put a 10-foot hole in the boat and sank the boat right there, right then and there on the spot. And and they, and because of that, Tony Quest and his men in 1963, uh, I think it was April 1963, came out uh, uh, in uh, Life magazine on a whole big story of the uh, anti-Castro uh, freedom fighters uh, trying to take on the Soviet Union, <laughs> Fidel Castro. And they raised so much hell that uh, Tony Cuesta was called to the uh, Fountain Blue Hotel one morning. And uh, 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 the station chief at the time in Miami for the FBI um, his name Davis. That he just went by the name of Davis. He said, "Look, Tony, put on a sport coat, open shirt, uh, put on your good shoes and a nice pair of slacks. We have a meeting at 9 a.m. Don't be late at the Fountain Blue Hotel." And they went over there and they went up in an elevator all to the top floor. Frank Sinatra was down below in the boom boom room singing, and they walked down this hall. Uh, 
walked down this hall with double doors and they walked in and sat down with 360 degree view in the most expensive uh, place in the house. And they sat there and had some coffee. And all of a sudden the door walked, uh, door opens up of another suite and Bobby Kennedy walks in ah. and he said, uh, he said, Mr. Cuesta, he said, don't think Jack and I are not uh, uh, happy and, and indicted to you people for uh, for doing what you're doing. But really, we can't start World War Three, World War Three, over sinking freighters and blowing up Russian material over on Cuba. And eventually, they, the Kennedy, Kennedy administration, confiscated all of their boats and armament and guns and everything else. It was them. So, so that's a great. I wanted to bring up the the Kennedy assassination, and this is a good way of bringing it up because it's very clear that the Bay of Pigs decision was a bad one. Uh, I mean, uh, clearly, Bud, and everybody knows, everybody who studied that, that was the worst of all worlds. And it's great that Tony and 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 his folks were wise enough to say this is stupid, and God bless him for for having recognized that. But it sounds like at some point. The policy, the anti-Cuban uh, uh, policy, and those involved were essentially being shoved aside by the Kennedys. Is is that accurate from your uh, your research? Very, 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 yeah. and very. So was, was it to the? Was I, can, I can I can tell I can tell you what I can tell you, yeah, and please. what's the, uh, the the what the publisher uh, Post Hill Post Hill Press Knox the. Uh, relatively conservative wing of Simon and Schuster. They have a, the lawyers that go through your manuscripts and everything. Well, okay. and they, I, they I, call, I'm, a, I'm a published writer too. I'm a New York Times bestselling author. Yeah. So yeah. The process. yeah they, they, they called, they called me on the phone. They said, okay, if we change this word and eliminate <laughs> this one line, everybody is safe on this. Yeah. You can innuendo, you can in, innuendo right. all, all you want, but innuendo, leave it at that. Right. You know, yeah, so, you have to be uh, about uh, definitive, uh, definitive characterizations that you state factually versus uh, actual speculation. Is that is, right? Is that's what they kind of ask you to do? Apparently. Let let let, let me let, let me clarify this, and you can yeah. you can vision all this. But this all is right. all true. If a thirteen year old, if you bought a BB gun for a thirteen year old, you would have a knock on the door by the FBI if you were Cuban, and they would say. Uh, what are you doing with uh, you're buying a BB gun for your 13 year old boy? Are are you uh, uh, brainwashing or training the uh, the kids with BB guns? You know, and Tony would say, you know, he couldn't believe it. Uh, yeah. you, you know, so what what I what I'm trying to say is that all of their guns, all of their information, all their boats, everything came out of New Orleans. Yeah, well, that goes they back. Couldn't, they couldn't. The, yeah, yeah, they, they couldn't buy squat. Part of the story, then, which obviously we we would recognize that overlap with um, other figures within the JFK assassination constellation. Is that is that accurate? I mean, it was it was kind of a constellation. It sounds like Tony was part of. Uh, I asked him one time. We were sitting around having a glass of wine, and I asked him one time. I said, Tony. I said, "What do you know? What do you know about the Kennedy, advance, uh, Kennedy assassination?" And we yeah. were very good friends at the time, and we talked about everything. You know, and he took a sip of his wine and looked out the sea off the sun deck, and he turned to me and he said, "Well, he said I wasn't anywhere near that at all. He said I was on the island of uh, Anguilla or whatever it is, that little island off of Cuba, with my men. They had trouble with their boat. They had to go ashore, and they used to bury things in the sand." And ammunition and stuff and plastic and cosmolines and then you know and he said no I, I wasn't anywhere near that that was quite a shame uh, sorry to hear about that you know, you know, and that's I, I didn't pursue it any further at all. Well, it's interesting though because I mean I, I don't want to get you in trouble with your publisher. Obviously, I'm I'm very sensitive to that sort of thing, but it seems to me that that um, the whole Cuban community really went against the, I mean, a lot of folks had motivation here to go against the Kennedys. And I don't want to make this about JFK. I want this to focus on Tony. But it seems to me the, the Cuban community, the the mafia, uh, there was a number of powerful organizations that just weren't happy with the Kennedys one way or another. And it seems to me that Tony may have had a, a fairly good, maybe if he wasn't involved, he, he may have had a good understanding of kind of how things were unfolding. Would that be accurate? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I'm sure that he knows a lot more than uh, than he uh, ever cared to uh, tell me. He, he told me a lot about Fidel and Shea and 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 the the uh, FBI and the CIA and the you know different the problems they had with with them warring among themselves, and then they would lay it all on the Cubans, you know, and it it was always asked backwards, uh, you know, it was, it was very difficult. So Tony said, screw it, I'm going out on my own, create commandos L, and we'll do things our way at our time that we plan at the right time, at the right place. And he was he was more than successful. But so that's, back up that's, just... Back up We want to continue that conversation in part two of the show because this is a great place to leave it because the very thing you're talking about, Bud, is what we want to talk about is kind of how this is noteworthy and, apparent and something important enough for a, a, a show. So we'll, we'll pick it up on part two of The Hard Truth. Uh, we're taking this quick break. We'll be back uh, just right after this, uh, continuing our conversation with Bud Albright. We're talking about his book uh, regarding Tony Cuesta, Freedom Fighter, the war with Fidel Castro and to take back Cuba. So we'll be back at the break. Stand by. Who's got time for a nasal invasion messing up your lifestyle? Crush those nasties before they become a problem. For a limited time, when you add the new Cofix RX throat spray to your order with the coupon code OUTLOUD, you'll receive 20% off the entire purchase. Go to americaoutloud.shop. That's americaoutloud.shop. And use coupon code OUTLOUD. Use CofixRx because it works. Spike proteins help viruses enter into your cells, disrupting your health and your well-being. Global Healing's Foreign Protein Cleanse detoxes your body of spike proteins, which allows your body to repair from within, supporting your immune and respiratory systems and regulating your inflammatory response. Formulated by Dr. Edward Group and by Dr. Brian Artis, Foreign Protein Cleanse targets and detoxes spike proteins in the body. Go to americaoutloud.shop and get 15% off using the code OUTLOUD. Global healing, giving you the power to take control of your health naturally. World-class care from doctors you can trust, all from the comfort of your home. That is One Wellness. Dr. Peter McCullough and his team at The Wellness Company launched the One Wellness membership to provide free monthly supplements and unlimited telemedicine access with doctors that share your values. Be a part of a revolutionary new healthcare system that puts your health and well-being above the interests of Big Pharma's bottom line. It's the way healthcare should be. Go to outloudcare.com today and use code OUTLOUD for 25% off your first month of One Wellness. ASEA believes that inside each of us is the potential to feel our very best. Our customers will tell you how our products have made a difference for them, from improving immune health and supporting gut health to reducing the appearance of wrinkles and even improving mind, mood, and energy. Make our breakthrough products an essential step in fulfilling your greatest potential. ASEA, we power potential. For exclusive savings, use code OUTLOUD to save 15% off your first order today. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and disability. Lifestyle changes are critical, but you can also support your heart with concentrated nutrients. Healthy Cell created heart and vascular health to support cholesterol and blood pressure with CoQ10, vitamin K2, resveratrol, and soluble fiber. And Healthy Cell's not a pill. It's a patent-pending gel you swallow. Get heart healthy. Go to HealthyCell.com and use code OUTLOUD for 20 25% off your first order. HealthyCell.com. Code out loud for 25% off. Well, the year 2024 must be the year of the Patriot, and AmericaOutloud.news will equip you with all the information you need to give new meaning to the words Patriot Act. For our actions always ultimately define our words. Now is our time, my fellow Americans. America Out Loud Talk Radio. Liberty and justice for all.
Hey, this is the Hard Truth, Tony Schaefer, part two. Still powered by Six Hour, never settle. I had a choice of what I carried in combat. I always carried the best. I recommend you carry the best. The best of Six Hour, never settle. Uh, we're still on the America Out Loud talk radio network, also available on their podcast network. Check them out. Check us out. Or Project Sentinel, projectsentinel.com.net. And uh, obviously, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So part two of the show, we're being joined by the rest of the crew, <clears throat> the robust Chris Cordani and like the hearty Elizabeth Breckenkamp. So folks, welcome welcome to part two. Hello. And mm-hmm. uh, we're still joined today by Bud Albright. Uh, Bud is the author of the book, Tony Cuesta, the Freedom Fighter, The War with Fidel Castro to Take Back Cuba. And uh, spoiler alert, they never got Cuba back. Just saying. So anyway, uh, Bud, uh, we're happy to have you continue your discussion, our discussion on Tony. We're just wrapping up. First part, we talked about kind of the background, the the circumstance, the players who were all roving around the 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 the. Uh, the the uh, the Caribbean, uh, Florida, and uh, Cuba during those days, and so uh, at this point in the story, basically, Tony just gets upset and says, "I'm going to go off on my own because the Kennedys aren't helping him." Uh, obviously, his friend Fidel has gone deep red. Uh, you got all these other knuckleheads, but you know, moving the country into the moving Cuba into the Soviet sphere of influence. So Tony takes it upon himself to go do stuff. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, first of all, uh, he tried. He he was successful at raising money uh, to do that. I mean, it's yeah. it's not uh, you have to go out and buy offshore powerboats, uh, especially made. And there was a company up in North Miami that was managed and run by uh, a Cuban American, if you will, which helped him build very strong boats that were set up to handle weight and very fast with different engines. And then he had two or three of them made. And uh, with that, they would be drawn out of uh, a base uh, in Key West or Marathon Key, and they would be towed by sport, a sport fisher or eventually an old boat that the first, their first boat happened to belong to the Kennedys, believe it or not, uh, that was purchased up in the Palm Beach. Yeah. Uh, Tony, Tony Cuesta uh, had an affair with the daughter of a terribly, terribly wealthy man and he was involved politically uh knew jimmy carter personally during that particular era and lived in the old rockefeller home on palm beach island which was pink with pink with a white tile roof i've been there to see the place the location site and she uh this gorgeous daughter uh met tony cuesta when the cuesta and his top men came up to to there to uh to try and, and raise money. Um, I just heard a beep, which, uh, I might have to, I might have to, uh, charge my, uh, cell phone here a little yeah, bit. Hey, we'll continue uh, but, to do uh, it again. I, but yeah, to that point. So yeah. I think this is what, what basically we've gotten to now is the fact that, that your book illustrates the kind of the, the James Bond aspects of his life after all of this intrigue. Well, was around yeah, him, they, decided to they, do used, they used to call, they used to call, they used to call him the James Bond and, uh, it's Cuban history, uh, Barnes and Noble and, uh, and Amazon gave me five stars right from the gate. It's getting terrific reviews. And, uh, we spoke uh, recently in Coral Gables, uh, last Sunday, and uh, that was a success. And the Cubans there, they came up to me and I did this. My grandfather did this. And my father did this. And uh, fathers and grandfathers, you know. But this is marvelous for young people to understand what really yeah. went on, what really happened between Cuba, the United States. And, and yes, there was, uh, uh, you know, there was, uh, like you said, there was so many different there was Castro's people, there was Tony's people, the FBI, the CIA, the a, mob. Yeah. Everybody was involved in the damn thing, and that that's a that's another that's another show and another story all in itself, you know. Yeah. But uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be this coming weekend. We're gonna be at Barnes and Noble uh, in um, Boca Raton at two o'clock in the afternoon, signing posters and signing books. And a great opportunity to chat with me. Exactly. I love talking Saturday to people. Or Sunday. Uh, Sunday. 
Sunday. Okay, so we'll be sure to note that because we actually we'll, we'll be able to. This show actually airs before that, so that's good. So we'll uh, note that. Yeah. We'll have information oh, cool. out on the book and everything. So yeah, so and it's great because I think our Florida, it, Chris, our network is based in Florida, right? I believe it is. Yes. Yeah. So this is yes. good for you guys. Yeah. Yes. So all right. So but we'll we'll promote that. We're going to have the book on uh, uh, our website and all that. And I think it's great because yeah, I do highly endorse anything that gives context to a very chaotic time in our history that did ultimately come to, uh, I think, one of the closest times we ever came to having a nuclear war, which was the, the thir yep. 13 days in October of 62. I was born on the first day of that whole thing. So, yeah, I'm I'm uh, familiar with that. So this, this, I think, would give great context and understanding of those who need to see it. So, again, I think everybody needs to rush out and, and, and buy Tony Cuesta, uh, Cuesta uh, Freedom Fighter, The War with Fidel Castro to Take Back Cuba. And so this weekend, again, when is that, when are you guys going to be out but, uh, talking about this in Boca? Uh, we're going to be. We're, I'm in Boca Raton right now, and this Sunday at uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, 2 to 6:30, uh, I'm going to be uh, signing uh, photos and signing uh, posters and, uh, and 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 signing books for people that come. And it uh, makes a great gift for any teenager on up and the, the older people. And it has action, adventure, drama, romance, and tragedy. <laughs> and it's uh, I'm getting more response from women than I am men, so that must tell you something right there. <laughs> That's great. So, so we'll definitely talk about that. But speaking of of drama, romance, and um, chaos, let's talk about Star Trek. <laughs> That's always okay. a good subject. Yes. That's a good subject. All right. That's all good. right. I know. Okay, so now, now, for the audience to understand, you are one of the original red shirts. Am I right on that? Bud? Yes, sir. There you go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There you go. Yes, sir. I was and, and one of two you. of the first red shirts. Yeah. So, and by the way, you're still alive, so that's a good sign, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Shatner and I, uh, you know, there's a few of Shatner. You know, he goes up in the rocket planes. He said, "I, you know, he's he's uh, Shatner's 92, and uh, I, I'm getting up there. Not 92. I'm not that. I'm younger than Shatner. He was 35 at the time, and I was 29. So there you go." Uh, yeah, I, I, I did. I did a show. I did the, the very first show. Uh, what are little girls made of? And uh, I was in a red shirt and then they finally killed me off. And Roddenberry said, listen, bud, you know, we like you. We're going to bring you back. We'll put you in a green shirt. So, I mean, he was, he was, well, not, you got promoted. He was nuts, there was, you know, yeah, so oh, you... I got promoted. Then I, then I was a navigator. So I had, I, I always take when I do a, uh, a book signing i always take it some star trek things because that 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 gets people's attention you know and then they go oh tony oh, Cuesta. Okay. yeah of course you episode. know it gives you a little credibility <laughs> i do want to talk about that episode what a little girl's made of because that that is a one of the episodes that, that a lot of folks just look to is one of the what the, the definitive really good stories because obviously for those who don't follow star trek is about mccoy being seduced by an alien that looked like uh, a pepperoni pizza is that accurate Pepperoni pizza. Oh uh, well, I don't. I, I don't. Uh, what what I what I remember of <laughs> pepperoni pizza. Uh, what I remember of it is is that uh, um, <laughs> that uh, yeah, there was a, a, a fellow named Ted. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Ted Cruz. Ted. No, what? Well, not Ted Cruz. Bundy. No. Uh, Ted. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> hey yo. Hey yo. No, he, he was he was seven foot tall. He was seven foot tall, and he ended up killing me. His hands were the size of a, a baseball mitt. He's long past. He's a, a wonderful, very gentle guy, but he uh, he's the one that killed me in the show in the red shirt. Oh, oh okay, I got what you're talking about. So, so basically, um, you're talking about uh, not, he played Lurch, didn't he? Uh, he no, I, I no, he he play, he had an, he had another name. It it wasn't it wasn't that I can't remember at the, at the moment. Um, After it was 50, 58 years ago, you know that the, all all of that happened. Well, anyway, the big but, thing, uh, obviously is that the the whole production of Star Trek was uh, extraordinary for the time. So you were there and you were a witness. So tell us about how you mentioned in the pre interview, uh, Bud, that this was one of the first four shows. That uh, uh -huh. color back in Wasn't the city. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. So it's about how controversial that was, and and the the, the kind of the atmospherics because it, it, people don't understand how cool this was. Ted, well, Cassidy. it was cool, but the, the, the 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Refreshing me here. Ted, that's right. Ted Cassidy. Yeah. Ted Cassidy was supposed to throw me down a well and they wanted to drill a hole in the floor and uh, throw me down the, in the, in the, the soundstage floor. And when the, the people running the studio said, you want to, you want to what? You want to cut a hole in the floor of the, of the, of the, uh, of the of the biggest soundstage we have that came from the Cecil B. the Mill silent pictures. I yeah. don't think so. First of all, we don't know what's down there, and we don't want to know. So <laughs> nobody's cutting a hole in the floor of of stage nine at Terabon Studios. So anyway, Ted Cassidy broke my neck and oh. uh, killed me in the in the in the first one. Well, at least you didn't send up, stand up, uh, show up like, uh, like Piker. Is it is Captain Pike later in the, in the wheelchair? You know, you you didn't have that at least. So, yeah. Um, well, a, a couple of interesting notes. In the, the first day I went over there, I couldn't believe the set. Uh, it was absolutely incredible, and NASA was there at the time, and the whole thing like that. And things that, if it could go wrong, it did go wrong. I remember standing on the soundstage there, and behind me was the director and uh, Leonard Nimoy, yeah. and they were talking. And I remembered Leonard Nimoy. This was this was the the, the 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 interview day. I mean, they could, you know, where the other people like me came over there. And I remember Leonard Nimoy saying, "He said, what the f do you want to do with my ears?" <laughs> oh no. <laughs> What do you want to do with my ears? And the rest is legendary. The rest, yeah. the rest is legendary. And one time there was, a, I know, doing a show, there was a, uh, there was a door there, and uh, there was a, a big actor named Malachi Throne from Universal. He worked with Bob Wagner on It Takes a Thief, and he's over there. And he said, "Captain," he said, "I think he's right here behind this door. We'll look now." And he reached up and he grabbed the handle, and it came off in his hand. And without a beat, he looked at Shatner and he said, who the hell built this ship? And everybody fell on the floor <laughs> and it shut down for 30 minutes while people were screaming. It, it, and it happened all the time. Lights would go on when they shouldn't. And when you think about it, when you look back, uh, you know, who would send up in space all those good looking women with mini skirts on? And no seat belts and no seat belts or harnesses on any of the chairs. And everybody could walk around real casually in a space anything you know it isn't that smooth but listen people bought it they bought the actors they bought the movie uh i mean the uh the whole the whole uh show uh and it, it eventually it took off but it took off slowly but yeah. when it went into to uh syndication across the country it got uh, uh an older generation and uh, a younger generation too. And then it went into 60 countries in syndication around the world. Wow. And uh, I still, I still get uh, out of all the things I've ever done. Uh, I still get, Oh, maybe uh, oh, three, four five, six uh, letters a month from uh, like uh, servicemen that were five years old or something on uh, in uh, the, you know, the Straits of our moose on a destroyer or something send me letters a star trek fan and the whole thing like that and uh, it, it, it's really it, it's moving i always shake my head on that, that that star trek what little i did in it uh really made a lot of noise not not me but i mean the first four seasons was that more it was uh you know bill shatner and uh, leonard nimoy and uh, all the original people were alive and well and everything and, and so many of them went on to have their own shows become writers directors producers authors whatever so that that's the good part and anytime there's a show uh a reunion anywhere they're usually in las vegas at the valleys or rally or, or rios or something like that they're always interested in the early shows and boy people mm -hmm. come up to your table and you know they break into tears because they remember watching the shows with their their parents and their kids and and everything like that it's it's really quite moving you know so that's funny. So you think Will Shatner gets uh, more fans than Will Wheaton? <laughs> <laughs> Will Wheaton. <laughs> uh, Ensign Crusher, uh, often called the most familiar uh, character in the Star Trek uh, universe. I think I, so. I still go with Captain Janeway on that one, but that's a different he was story. He's so convincing as being day. annoying. Yeah. What I do have is something convincing, though. It is time for Tony's Takes, and Tony's Takes is <gasps> powered by Sig Sauer. Yes, it is that time around. Oh. So let me start. All right. 
And uh, I'm getting hot takes from everybody. And of course, uh, Bud, let's hear some from you as well. Let's Bud. start here. Tony's takes. Okay. And once again, powered by Sig Sauer, never settle. Never settle. The Mayorkas never impeachment settle. did not go through earlier this week. <laughs> but a Utah, a savvy Utah representative changed his vote from yay to nay in order to call for a motion to reconsider. That mm-hmm. means the door is open for a revote. However, what are the chances this will actually go through the next time? Well, I think it depends, Chris, on if uh, Superman is able to get uh, the kryptonite uh, away from uh, Lex Luthor, because, you know, that is actually the secret identity of Mayorkas. He is actually Lex <laughs> Luthor. I don't know if you knew that. I thought Lex Luthor was a genius. Well, he's 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 not. He, he didn't get impeached, did he? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I guess he is smart enough <laughs> to get out of that one. Hey, Lex, uh, Lex Luthor was by all. Uh, he was a, an amazing we villain. Lost, uh, Think about this. He, this guy's an amazing villain. The man was, um, uh, he he was a regular human, okay? He didn't have super strength like Superman, but he was the one guy that could always get under Superman's skin that could even defeat him at times. So here's one for you, Chris. Who's the be- better Lex Luthor? Uh, 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 the guy that played in House of Cards. Um, oh, my God, I'm having terrible time with names today. Um, uh Oh my goodness! Why am I having senior moments, Chris? This is terrible. <laughs> oh, uh, we we need some memory enhancement there, I, I guess. Man, I do. So no, we had uh, um, God, he played. Uh, I can think of all his characters. I can't think of his name. So uh, we got the guy that played uh, Pappy in uh, the French Connection, Pappy Doyle. Right. Okay. Ah, you know who it is, right? What's his name? The actor. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, there is there was the politically correct Superman. Was it, was it Gene Hackman or um uh the, the who, who did the better Lex Luthor? Gene Hackman or Kevin Spacey? Oh, I was thinking Kevin Spacey, but I thought that was probably wrong. Oh, I I should have gone with my first. You I'm, going, I'm going with John Cryer. You got John. like Ducky as as Lex Luthor, okay? <laughs> hey, he doesn't have hair anymore. I guess that's true. He did play uh, Lex Luthor in a, a bit of Superman and Lois, by the way. He did? <laughs> yes. But, wow. but, <laughs> I have to go Gene Hackman. Yeah. That's like that's like Pippi Longstockings playing Nancy Pelosi. It's like, wow, it just didn't really yeah. fit. Oh, well, Gene yeah. Hackman was more convincing. I think yeah. Gene Hackman could play Nancy Pelosi, right? She, well, Absolutely. Not Absolutely. He's that old, I guess, yeah. <laughs> you can put away the vodka like nancy does just saying so oh that's gotta hurt all right you here's have to another just one. lift up the eyelids and glue them you know yeah. like she had. all right let, let's get tony's takes on this one president <laughs> biden said he recently met with dead former french president francois <laughs> mitterrand he did so is joe biden a medium or <laughs> mentally checked out so i know he, he, he sees dead people so it's good and, and i think that uh he also had a conversation with uh, the late uh, uh, Madeline Monroe. She was he, he she she told him all about the Kennedys. That's why you know he's so well informed. And I think uh, he also had a, a a brief meeting with FDR, who told him all about how to do in, the uh, internship, the internment of of uh, of uh, uh, Americans. Since you know they did the Japanese Americans, he wants to expand it out next time. So you know he hey, Jeff oh, is well versed in talking to the dead. You know, they did Italian Americans too. You know, when uh, when Roosevelt was president, he interned Italian Americans, and that was a mistake to let him out. That's right. Oh my god! <laughs> but nobody ever talks about that, so we Italians have to rise up here. That's a solidarity. That's what I, I think. Besides you, you're great. But I've got some other great friends: Tony Zinni, John Tempone. Um, who else? There's some other really great Italians that I've uh, had the uh, pleasure of knowing. I don't. I didn't know Frank Sinatra. Did you know Frank Sinatra, Chris? No, no, no. I didn't know him. No, I would 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 have right? liked to have sung a duet with him. Yeah, but I would have stank. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a different story. That'd be fun. You're yeah. like a one-hit wonder. Hmm. One-hit wonder. That's right. I'd probably ruin the song. That's that's the problem. Uh, all right, here's another one. Shortly after a meeting between Biden administration and Mexican officials reaching an undisclosed agreement, like, you know, those undisclosed agreements between Mexico and the United States, Mexican immigration and law enforcement officials began to round up immigrants yeah. along the you know, along the country's northern border. As you notice, in January, the, uh, the influx was cut a bit. Looking mm-hmm. at that, I am under the impression that uh that uh uh biden is preparing for the election season by saying well we cut down uh 
we cut down the the entrance here and cut down immigration and we're we're, we're controlling the border. Uh, yeah, that stuff. However, how many uh, will enough people fall for this? Well, if um, you basically promote this to all Walmart shoppers, maybe. But I don't yep. think you know. <laughs> I, I don't think most people. No, I don't think so. I mean, um, I, I if you look at the interviews over the last 24 hours and Joe Joe Biden is being called out for his saying the border crisis is all because of Trump. Oh, I saw like, that yesterday. Yeah. Really? He's an idiot. It's like yeah, I don't I don't you know, I it goes back to that I always I love the princess bride and I always go back to that um <laughs> scene. I don't think you understand the meaning of the word you're using. Yeah. Uh, cuz <laughs> it's like exactly. he spent he spent the entire speech blaming Trump. Yeah. Uh, except for the end. He had a question about the about the hostages and in, in 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 Gaza, and the man's trying to sift through notes and pauses. And I have uh, the opposition. Now they're yeah. terrorists. Yeah, or he's yeah. thinking he, the the guy struggled to answer the question. The man cannot go off script. He's going to be yeah. hidden in the basement most of the year. Trotted out for a couple well, of victory laps and then brought right. back down again. No, that's why they didn't. They're not letting him talk at the Super Bowl. I'm sure that CBS would have softball questions for him, or ABC. I think mm -hmm. it's CBS. Whoever it is would do softball. But speaking of, of softballs, not that I want to talk about balls, Ooh. but um, the issue relating to the, the Biden messaging is, is, I think, quite atrocious. And I know you have something else you want to bring up here, but I want to hit this real quick regarding Biden. Um, essentially, what he was saying is that all all the, the font of all evil is is Donald John Trump, and our friend uh, Andrew, the senior uh, analyst on the on on uh, the interwebs, walk, you know run. Andrew, don't walk run, which uh, right. we're all friends with him. So I had a long, cool. by the way, we had an hour long catch up session on the phone the other day. Great, Andrew, lo love you, bit. You're you're a great guy. We love your content. We'll have you we're on fans. back again, Russell. Yeah, here. we're huge yeah. fans. His last video had Joe Biden just saying the words Donald Trump, I think. Wasn't it like every time it's like it's like just every time he's ever mm -hmm. it's like Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. We watched it again last night. It was like 22 times yeah. in like the span of like five or 10 minutes. It's yeah. unbelievable. We keep yeah. pausing it and going back and just laughing hysterically. It's like well, his, his, his lines he's just pathetic. He's yeah, so his, pathetic. His, his lines are Donald Trump and MAGA Republicans, the MAGA Republicans, extremists, and and uh, they're not your they're not your father's Republicans. And, and he's he's pushing that message, and people are falling for it. I and don't the even fake know anger, how. Like he's so upset. Oh, he, he uh, whispers and gets angry. I don't think they're falling for it, Chris. I, I look. I live in a very rural community down here in North Carolina, and a lot of folks who you would not normally think of as. Trump supporters, I don't necessarily think they're going to support Trump, but they're fed up with Biden. And right. I, I don't think Biden's going to have the support he thinks he does. Oh, so. Bi Biden got the anti-Trump um, vote. It looks like Trump's going to get the anti-Biden vote. You mentioned the Super Bowl, right. Tony. You mentioned the Super Bowl. So I here did. it is. It comes oh. this weekend. I don't really care if Taylor Swift is there or not. I'm not a big fan. I don't really care, but she's going to get a lot of camera time. I get it. Mm -hmm. But I, right. I would rather see the kid whose parents are suing Deadspin for that defamation mm -hmm. In, the, in that fake blackface scandal. Yeah. I want to see him get free tickets and lots of camera FaceTime, but in full team colors makeup. What's your take? That'd be great. Well, I hope he does. I hope he does. And by the way, didn't did, wasn't Taylor Swift uh, Mini, Melly Vanelli in a previous life? Wasn't it? Maybe. I could swear that was her. So, <laughs> but no, I... <laughs> Yes, I mean, come on. She, they they kind of, you know, they, 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 it could be her. It could be her. So anyway, no, I think uh, the kid deserves whatever he gets, and the, the, he deserves a full a full apology. The, the NFL could do it do itself uh, very well by uh, acknowledging that this was a wrong that they're going to help right, but mm -hmm. I doubt no, it. Unfortunately, not a chance. So, no, not a chance. I don't not think the NFL will, but that would be cool. so. I like that well, idea. Just yeah. for the record. I'm not watching the Super Bowl. I, I have not watched the Super Bowl since um, I think the NFL went broke about 10 years ago. I'm just, I have no interest. So if, if you all love football, go knock yourself out. Nobody's saying you shouldn't do it. But, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd rather go out and watch reruns of uh, my my three sons well, or Marcus Welby, MD or something. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm, a, I don't know. I'm a Giants fan. So usually around week six or seven, it's back to hockey season. <laughs> 
Well, we're going to a, a Super Bowl party only because I like the party part. I don't really care. But since it's the Chiefs, Bob uh, does care. Cause well, good for him. Well, good for Bob. You know, and by the way, I mean, if <laughs> a, a little hint on that. If you take several shots of Jack Daniels, the parties go faster. Just saying. So, you know. I think so. That's Nancy Pelosi's advice to you. That's right. <laughs> if you could yes. you could you could be Nancy Pelosi's spirit animal and have a bottle of vodka. That would be good. So Oh. That's good. Her spirit hurt. animal would be the what? The the Viper? Oh, I don't know. The Crypt Keeper. That's right. Now. Oh yes. So did yeah, you hear yes. about it? my one I know we gotta go, but you you heard that Nikki Haley lost against a, a a nondescript candidate, like a generic candidate in the uh in the Nevada caucuses right apparently it's like uh, yeah we'll take anybody she got the, 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 basically none of the above got 64 percent. she got 31 percent. it's like okay that's a that's oh a my gosh nice I job that one but nice she job. did she did carry uh, uh groundhogs and garden gnomes so she she won the garden home and garden gnome and uh, ground so rodents and uh, garden gnomes lover just saying uh that's i guess nice. i guess uh sand uh, sand crabs and scorpions didn't uh, like her that much did they no, the scorpions went for for Harry Reid's grave. I don't know why. You know. Oh. I guess groundhogs need love too. Right. Well, on that note. <laughs> on that note. Well, we got to go. Thank you all for joining us for another hard truth. Uh, we had uh, 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 Bud Albright on earlier. We went through his book. I uh, hope you all check it out. Tony cool. Cuesta. Freedom Fighter, uh, the war with Fidel Castro and to take back Cuba. Uh, hopefully we'll talk more about him at, uh, this at some point because he had some great Star Trek stuff. Of course, you ought to have him back just for Star Trek stuff because I think it would be yeah. a great a great thing. I want to talk more about the shows and stuff like that. So, um, we're in. Hey, the man was a great stuntman, too. Yeah. Well, we didn't get to the stuntman part. I, right. he, did, he didn't even Robert show us anything. Wagner, he, didn't, he didn't jump off anything and break his foot for us. It's terrible. So maybe we'll uh, come back to do that next time, right? Don't start it. That's right. So we've been joined by Liz Breckenkamp, uh, Chris Cordani. Uh, we are signing off. Thank you for being here. We'll see you again next week.